The way Washington sees it, 2011 is the make or break year in Afghanistan, during which NATO must somehow turn the quickening tide of insurgency and allow for the United States to begin withdrawing its troops a decade after the invasion. To see the effects of Washington's policy on the ground, I returned to Afghanistan this year to live among the people in whose abused, battered land U.S.-led NATO troops are waging their war. To allow my audience a glimpse of this country the way Afghans themselves see it, through the windows of a mud hut, from the back of a pack animal trudging on unpaved desert tracks that still remember the footfalls of Alexander the Great's army from the flatbed of a truck wobbling across mountain passes that tick with landmines and bristle with ambushes. What I saw was both heartening and devastating. In northern Balkh province, one of the few oases that remain relatively calm, American troops have begun to carry out nighttime raids, deeply offending the people here, and threatening to turn Afghans who until now have been simply trying to survive this latest war into potential recruits for the insurgency. At the same time, the tens of billions of dollars the international community has pumped into Afghanistan have had little effect here. Child mortality is the second highest in the world, and opium addiction haunts villages. Most people live the same way they had when I first visited Balkh ten years ago, when the U.S.-led invasion began. Indeed, they seem to live the same way they had lived centuries ago, when Balkh gave the world the Sufi poet Rumi and Rabia Balkhi, the first woman known to compose poetry in both Arabic and Persian. Yet, Afghanistan and its people persevere. Despite the violence and privation that kills their loved ones and decimates their towns, they raise crops, graze sheep, bathe their children, weave carpets, make fragrant bread, and share it with strangers. They survive. This is Anna Batyan for the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting.